Good morning. Good morning. We're so pleased to see you all here. I'm Cynthia Milligan. And yesterday, we spent time with academia and the, and the nonprofit sector on talking about the future challenges for agriculture production. Today, now, we're turning to the power of the private sector in addressing the challenges that production agriculture is going to be facing over the next few years. So this panel is made up of CEOs of major companies that contribute to the solving of some of these issues for production agriculture. Let me introduce to you who is on the panel. We're not, I'm not gonna use their time by giving their complete bios. You have those, as you know, in your book. So if you would look at those. But uh, on my immediate left, uh, and uh, you're right next to me, I guess, <laughs> you're right of me, is, uh, is Mr. Jim Collins, who's the CEO of Corteva <laughs> AgriScience. Then, Liam Condon, who is the president of the Crop Science Division of Bayer. And then Josephine Akot, who is the managing director and founder of Victoria Seeds in Kampala, Uganda. Third is, um, okay, is, <laughs> is Eric. Uh, we've got Eric Fearwald, who is the president and CEO of Syngenta. And finally, in a different order than I had them, uh, is, um, uh, let's see, so that's then um, Chris. Chris Nelson, a president and CEO of Kemen Industries, uh, which as you know is based here in, in Des Moines, uh, uh, but is worldwide. So we will get started with questions. Um, and the first one we'd like to address is on the current trend lines and with the increasing challenges of climate uh, volatility, are we on track to feed the 10 to, to uh, tw or 9 to 10 billion people uh, by the year 2015? And if not, uh, what would be needed? So we'll start with you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Cynthia. And good morning, uh, everyone. It's, uh, it's great to be back uh, with you again today. Uh, and um, with, uh, with my colleagues here on this panel. Um, it's a great question. For those of you who heard me uh, speak yesterday on the climate panel, uh, you might recall uh, that I talked about Corteva's um, total commit or commitment to advancing the science behind making um, agriculture more climate positive. Um, and we committed to doing some things immediately uh, to really begin that. Now, that commitment, that is one of the big challenges that I think go hand in hand with your question um, around food security uh, and the progress that we need to continue to make to feed the nine to 10 billion people um, that, that we've, uh, we've talked about. So um, working in, in that one space to double productivity while improving the sustainability of the production system um, we view those two things as hand in hand. So we've made good progress. I, I think there are um, uh, recent studies out around food security that at the pace that we're on, that we will uh, continue to improve the food security of countries around the world. Um, at the same time, that pace is not gonna be uh, fast enough or steep enough uh, to rise to the challenge by, uh, by 2050. So um, it, it's going to take a number of elements and I think that's why uh, companies like ours and others represented here um, are a part of a very uh, a powerful opportunity uh, to drive forward things like um, uh, the, the the use of data uh, and information, the use of biotechnology, uh, education, especially with smallholder farmers. Uh, our ability to double productivity in some of the African countries that we interact in today is simply a matter of just sharing good agronomic information. No big technical. Um, uh, change is needed to take those first big steps. So, um, so I would say we've made good progress, but at the rate of, of change and the rate of pace that we're on today, we're still going to fall short. Good. And Jim, do you want to make any comments about Corteva? And As part of the opening, no, I think um, everyone had heard a little bit yesterday about Corteva. As you know, we, uh, we became a, a stand standalone uh, pure play um, ag company uh, effective on June 1st as we spun out of our, our parents. Uh, and we stood up a, a company, some 20,000 folks around the world, serving growers in over 140 countries. And we're really excited about the, the focus uh, that Corteva has on the grower, 
uh, but also being very mindful of where the large consumer trends uh, are headed and, and trying to be a, a champion to bring long-term consumer ideals together with helping those growers right there on that farm uh, really rise to those challenges. So, Great. Okay. And um, uh, Liam and each of you, is why don't you tell us a bit about uh, your companies and what they're doing um, as you address the, uh, the question on the challenges? Yeah, th th thanks a lot, Cynthia. So it's, it's great to be here. Um, I represent Bayer as, as the president of, of Bayer Crop Science. Um, and uh, we acquired last year Monsanto, um, and this is actually now the first full year of being together as, as a new combined company. And the reason behind that at the time was, was actually quite simple. Um, we both, I think both legacy companies foresaw um, an increase in the challenges in agriculture that it was going to get more and more difficult, particularly also with climate change, but simply due to the fact there's a growing population, there's limited natural resources, limited land, limited water. Um, and our, our hypothesis was we're going to need a lot more innovation um, than we're actually currently producing. Um, and to do that, we felt we could do it in a much better way as a combined company. So that, that was kind of the, the background for us. Um, as, as we look at the situation today, and, and with your, your opening question, I um, have to say I, I studied for a while economics, and, and the great thing about economics is you can explain every problem in the world through a simple graph, which is based on, on supply and demand. And, and if you look at the supply and demand equation of the food system, um, we'd have to say that the food system is not on a sustainable trajectory. On, on the demand side, um, I think it's, it's clear we have over 800 million people who go to bed hungry every night. We have another 2 billion who are somehow suffering from malnourishment. Um, so in essence, you've got about half of the global population on the demand side is actually not being served by the current food system adequately. And then on the production side, the supply side, clearly um, production is still too resource intensive. We've made great progress. But if we continue at the pace that we've had in the past, um, this is not a sustainable trajectory. So I think both on the demand and the supply side, clearly um, we need a lot more innovation to get to a healthy, sustainable food system. Josephine, if you'd uh, tell us, I know 15 years ago you founded your company because you saw a need. If you would uh, tell us a bit about that and then talk about the challenges and what you're doing to meet them. Yeah, uh, in the context of feeding the world or feeding Africa in 2050, I think uh, companies like Victoria Seeds, it has a role, but there are three areas that must be addressed if we are to achieve that. Uh, the gender gap, empowering women. The second one is uh, public investment in not just research, but also extension. Climate resistant or uh, climate resilient agriculture, and it should be sustainable. And the third one is political will. So I'll start with the first one. When I speak of empowerment of women, if we look at the FAO, I think, the report for Uganda in uh, 2018, it still shows what was happening at the time I was starting the company, that yes, 72% of the population is engaged in agriculture, but out of that, the labor force is provided by 76% of women, mostly crops, it's most of the crop produced, the labor is women, and men are mostly in fisheries and, uh, and possibly uh, fisheries and livestock. So if the women are doing most of the production, and the sad reality is the primary tool is still the rudimentary tools, the hand hoe, to me, I see it as a disgrace to humanity. If we set a goal to eradicate polio in, in, by the year 2000, it was done. I think we need to have some kind of goal to eliminate the hand hole. You cannot feed any population without mechanization. And I think that is something that must be reversed. We must have mechanization. I know 
you know, you are part of the world, it's just something that it's taken for granted. But mechanization at production, at crop management, and post-harvest, very basic mechanization. And I think that's where perhaps the, the creativity and innovation should come in. If the women are doing most of the production and it's mechanized, then that would help address the gender gap and they are empowered. Then I spoke of public investment, yes, because uh, climate change is something that as a business we are contending with. I spoke about it in other forums. Uh, drought tolerance is critical, but the biggest challenge is what can drive growth? Agro-industrialization, but even if we have seed systems, if you do not have matching finances, it won't work. As of now, when I want to go and I have any creative ideas, you can only get short-term loan of one year and you borrow at 20%. I think there is no way that any kind of uh, scaling up can happen. That is very, very difficult. And as I mentioned earlier, the financial institutions themselves, they don't have what it takes to profile the risk. They are bankers, they are not extension people. They don't understand how to profile this risk and they therefore cannot come with proper products. So we really need to look at the whole, the board of the board of the financial institutions in the continent and it comes to the lower level loan officer. They just need a mindset change and they need also be trained to understand to profile the risk. And the third one, political will. All these things, you can't do it without political will. And I mentioned because we always have the regional blocks, Comesa, SADAC, ECOWAS, East African community where I come from. I always see our heads of state going and taking photos and they make decisions, but they need to start taking business leaders with them up to the African Union. And then we have success stories over the continent. For example, if Uganda wants to go into agro-industrialization of cassava, we have Nigeria to learn from. So though, all those success, it's political will that drives it. I think if all of that is brought, then you will have much more successful businesses and then we will be moving towards the goal of feeding the world in 2050. Thank you, thank you. Well done. Eric, we'll toss the ball to you and if you'd want to make any opening remarks and then address this question of can we meet the challenges of feeding the additional population. Well, first of all, it's great to be back in Des Moines. I lived here with my family for a number of years, back in 03 to 08, and also great to be here for the World Food Prize again. It's such an important town for agriculture globally and such an important event. In fact, uh, you, you get a sense for how committed the, the, the community is to agriculture when at the front desk, a volunteer it was my uh, daughter's eighth grade science teacher, Jody Balmer. <laughs> and see people like Paul Schickler and others that uh, are here that have such a big impact on, on global agriculture. So great to be here, first of all. And also, uh, just great, great to be here for Ambassador Quinn's last year. He's had such a huge impact on, the, on global agriculture. So we really appreciate all that he's done. But let, let me talk about the challenges. I'm, I'm now the CEO of Syngenta. And like Corteva and Bayer, we're a global agriculture technology company uh, focused on seeds and crop protection and bringing them to farmers around the world and bringing new technology to help farmers feed the world, but also to take care of the planet while we do that. And I think you know, with the growing population, the growing needs to, to, to feed the world, I think we have challenges. I think we have big challenges. And you heard about some of these. I, I think, I, I think they, 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 First thing we have to do is we have to help farmers adapt to climate change. Just think about what's happened in, in the Midwest this year. The worst flooding in the history of the United States. This isn't, you know, I, I remember five-year floods or 10-year floods or talking about maybe 15-year floods. This is in the history of the United States. At the same time, we have the worst drought going on in Australia in the history of Australia. Highest temperatures in France and other countries. I mean, we have dramatic weather events that we have to help farmers deal with. 
And we have to do that with technology, and we have to do that with agronomic advice and digital tools, but we need science-based regulatory processes around the world so we can keep bringing better and better technology to help farmers deal with climate change. And we have to help, help them with, 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 with learning how to do it as well. At the same time, we have to help farmers reduce impact on climate change. Agriculture and food value chains contribute 25% roughly of greenhouse gas emissions. And I think we've done a great job of bringing farmers technology to reduce that impact, but we have to do more. We have to work together as, as agriculture technology companies with farmers and through the value chain for, with, with food companies all the way to consumers to do things like increase yields throughout the system, reduce waste, be able to feed the world with less land so that we can not only stop deforestation but reforest. And that takes technology and that takes training of farmers around the world. And in the developed world, we have those systems to do that. In the developing world like Africa, we have to do more. We have efforts like the Farm to Market Alliance that Syngenta, Bayer, and, and food companies and others are working together to help farmers better access the right technologies, learn how to farm, but also get their crops to the, to, to, to the marketplace. And, and, and we need to do that in a way that the farmers earn a decent living, but also take care of the land, reduce the impact on climate change, and produce more food to feed the world. If we can do both of those, we will solve this challenge. Very good. Chris. Good morning, and Cynthia, thank you very much. Um, I am Chris Nelson from Kemen Industries uh, here in Des Moines. We're also a global company. Uh, we're, we manufacture a series of ingredients that go both into animal feeds as well as human foods. Um, approximately 40% of the ingredients that we manufacture actually come from plants. So we're the largest uh, growers of rosemary, the largest growers of oregano, we're the largest growers of spearmint in the United States. Uh, and these are, we harvest these for very particular molecules that go into uh, human food as well as animal feed to provide specific nutrition as well as to provide specific activities. When I think about can we actually feed nine billion people in say 2045, um, the pessimistic uh, side of me says absolutely there's no way on our current tra trajectory uh, that we will be able to do this. The negative part of me is not so much on the science and technology because uh, as a scientist myself, I know that we have, are on the road in many cases to be able to provide the technology to be able to feed nine billion people. The problem becomes is really within our political, our regulatory institutions. Um, when I look across uh, India, which we're, uh, we're very active in, and realize that there's still 80 million children that are stunted due to inadequate nutrition during the first well, thousand days of life and then through age five, we know that that type of nutritional imbalance is not necessarily due to a lack of technology, but really is due to a lack of political will on so many F uh, levels to be able to get food to the right people and nutrition to the, uh, the children, literally, that need it. Um, that pessimistic side of me on a political area says is that we who have been involved so much in the technology can no longer sit by and develop only the technology and as the, uh, the famous Iowa movie says, build it and they will come. This is not necessarily the case. <laughs> so what, um, what technology are you all excited about that you think can make a difference? I felt there was some pessimism there. Let's turn to, to a positive side. Is there something out there that you're seeing that you would, that, or would you like to see that will really make a difference in the future? 
I, I could maybe start with, with two that I'm specifically aware of. You know, one is the advances we're making in data and, and informatics and you know, use of tools like, like AI to help mine uh, information and make it more broadly available so that everyone can use it. And you know, I, I'm often struck by, um, on, on an annual basis, uh, here in the US we have uh, corn yield contests. And um, you'll know that <clears throat> average yields in the United States, you know, around 170, 180 bushels an acre, really good soils, really high managed um, uh, farmland can do well over 200. And the people that are winning these yield contests are delivering 540 bushels of corn per acre. So this just isn't a five or a 10% increase. You know, it's, it's a dramatic increase. And they're using the same commercial hybrids that their neighbors use. And so the only difference between what that person is specifically doing versus another is, is knowledge. It's, it's they, they have knowledge and information and, and other agronomic techniques to help squeeze that yield that is on board that plant. It's there today to help squeeze that yield out and, and make it available. So um, you know, if we can do this on an acre basis in a small farm in Virginia, for example, we should be able to take that knowledge and information and leverage it. So, so the, that's why I, I agree with um, Chris. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that the technological solutions are not 10 years away, they're, they're here right now. So knowledge and information is, is one area. The, um, um, the second, I, I would agree, it has to be about uh, the regulatory frameworks by which we, we bring some of these newer uh, breeding techniques that we have available to us to market. Uh, and um, that's, that's why Corteva, along with other uh, folks here, you know, have, have really focused on how do we learn from some of the mistakes we made in the past around GMOs and GM technology? How do we become much more transparent and share the benefits? And how do we use those tools to actually do more good things that society will actually recommend as, as a positive. So things like I mentioned earlier, how could gene editing um, help with improving agronomics so that a plant could actually be part of improving the climate, uh, not as Eric said, you know, um, having much more of an impact. So those, those are two that, that I'm aware of that we have right now today. Those, those aren't 10 years away. Hmm. Liam, do yeah. you have something to add? Yeah, that may be uh, three, three technologies um, that I'm, I'm very excited about that I think will be completely disruptive in agriculture in a positive sense, but also related that to that one big concern. So the three technologies I'd say is um, number one, everything related to gene editing, CRISPR-Cas on the breeding side. I think there will be tremendous progress possible here. That will also help us from a sustainability point of view. Um, number two, um, I'd say synthetic biology. So the ability to actually bioengineer microbes um, and take the example that was on the, on the previous panel as well. Um, if we can help that microbes can basically fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and you need significantly less um, synthetic fertilizer, the impact that that has from a sustainability point of view is tremendous. And the third one is everything related to data sciences, the digitalization of the farm, because that allows us to act in a much more precise manner than was ever possible on the farm, and with that, avoid waste. And, and we're talking about dealing with a situation where, again, we've limited land, limited natural resources. So anything that can help us work in a much more precise manner, avoid waste, um, is going to be a huge benefit. Um, I'm, I'm completely convinced that we have all of the technology and innovation either with us today um, or coming soon. So we, we can feed 10 billion people, probably on less land than we even have today. I think this is completely possible. I think the big issue is, will this innovation be allowed? And, and that's been brought up um, a couple of times. Will the political slash regulatory will be there? Um, and the political slash regulatory will is heavily dependent on whether there is societal acceptance for the innovation. Um, and that societal acceptance needs to be based on um, what are the perceived benefits for consumers. And I think this is a part of the equation that, that has been probably, it's, it's, it's a muscle that's underdeveloped probably in, in the agricultural side. 
Um, we, as an industry, I think we've spent a lot of time focusing on benefits for farmers about what we do. Um, we've spoken less about benefits for consumers, either from a nutritional and or from an environmental point of view. And unless we engage much more explicitly around this and make it clear what are the benefits, but also be open about the risks of new technologies, um, I, I fear that there will be a pushback on the acceptance of the innovation that clearly has tremendous benefits for society. Yeah, uh, Cynthia, the technology that really excites me is uh, precision farming. And uh, precision farming is a way of addressing many of the challenges at once. As a seed company, we have the seed, but we lack the extension now, and uh, perhaps even information on the market. Once you have the precision farming technology, then you are able to cut your cost of production. You know what is the nutrients required for the crop, the moisture in the soil, any outbreak of disease. So it's still work in progress. I know as uh, uh, under my heart as Uganda Development Corporation uh, on the board, we are engaged with University of Turin in Italy and trying to use that technology. So that is exciting. But then thin technology is very critical. As I mentioned, financing is that challenge. Because uh, if we could use such information to de-risk financing, it would be very exciting. Because you know, there are foreign companies, Uganda is open, there are foreign companies that operate, but not one of them borrows from the commercial banks in Uganda. It's Masindi, where my factory is, you find that they are borrowing at under 1%. I'm competing with such companies. I think it's not fair. So if we can use the fin technology, so as Victoria Seeds, I can also borrow from Stanchart. USA, I can borrow from a European bank at 1%. Because then they are able to profile my risk, I don't have to be stuck in this 22% uh, interest and it really, you can't grow your business. You are just mm. hitting a dead end. Mm. And then maybe to the gentleman across, one other thing is you should look at equity and developing partnerships. That is what, if you are very serious about uh, driving growth in Africa, we can't grow our businesses with debt. There is very limited equity, actually almost zero. So you can come, instead of setting up as in Genta, in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, you can get SMEs, partner with them, build their capacity, mm. and then we address this common problem. Then the other FinTech is improving access to finance to the rural woman. Right now we have agency banking, it's great, but I think we need a lot more in terms mm. of technology so that they can be profiled and they can access gender-based uh, financing, and we need a gender-based financial policy, and that pushes us back to the political will. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Eric, do you want to? Yeah, I, I, think, I think GMO technology and gene editing technology, GMO is still very important and will be, and I think gene editing is a very exciting new technology. Let me give you two examples. All of us travel around the world a lot and visit farmers throughout the world. And one of the really, the, the, the number one crop in the world is corn. And one of the worst pests against corn is fall armyworm. And in the United States and Brazil, two big corn growing countries, fall armyworm is not an issue. Farmers get, get a, a GMO trait that deals with fall, fall armyworm and it's not an issue. You go to Africa and you meet with poor farmers and you see that fall armyworm has devastated their crop. They've completely lost it. And they don't have funds to, to, to withstand that kind of damage. You go to Vietnam, you see the same thing. Now it's going to China. This is a devastating pest that we have technology today that absolutely takes, takes away as an issue. And we would love to bring that technology throughout the world. All, all of our companies would love to do that. But we're prohibited from regulatory issues and other issues. But that, that's an example. Another example is there's a lot of waste in the food chain. You go to grocery stores, you see great fruit, and then, and then a few days later it, 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 gets, it gets bad and they throw it away. Gene editing 
today we, we, we've developed a, a tomato with gene editing that stops the production of a chemical that degrades the tomato, that makes it become waste after a few days, extends the shelf life by one to two weeks. Technology like that, it's, it, it's better tasting for the consumer, it lasts longer, and dramatically reduces waste. So these technologies are available today. They're perfectly safe. They're tested, proven safe. We've got to make sure that they can get to, get, get to the marketplace. And that echoes what Chris was saying earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two technologies that are sort of exciting me, uh, particularly in animal nutrition. Uh, the first is, uh, I, lo I love your word about precision agriculture, because we, we're talking very much about precision nutrition. Um, dairy cows, for instance, we today waste enormous amounts of soybean meal because we overfeed dairy cows crude protein. Uh, the reason for that is, is that the, the uh, rumen will uh, randomize amino acids and we need to uh, precision feed these animals so that the least amount of amino acids are utilized to can be converted into milk. That technology is starting to exist. Unfortunately, only about 5% of the dairy cows in the world are now utilizing that technology. So it's a, a technology that's highly, highly interesting. I think one that can dramatically reduce the waste that is actually occurring today in, in dairy production. The second one that excites me is really about the, uh, the unlocking of the secrets of the microbiota. What is happening within the intestinal tracts, not only of humans, but of animals as well. And the efficiency gains that we can be able to achieve for the production of meat, milk, and eggs through really an understanding of the microbiota can, in my mind, truly revolutionize animal agriculture and again, dramatically increase yields and drop the overall needs uh, for these gentlemen to provide the crops to feed to the animals that we uh, hopefully can drop those needs a little bit so that we will not have to produce the uh, hundreds and millions of tons of grains. So those two technologies are the ones that excite me. Cynthia? Great. Now, as, as each of you have been talking about, there are some roadblocks to getting to where you'd like to be using technology. Um, what are each of you doing to bring other stakeholders into the conversation to maybe turn that around to help with that? Yeah, go ahead on. Liam mentioned, Eric. Liam mentioned the importance of getting consumer acceptance, that, that we, we need to right. make sure that people understand the benefits of technology so that they, you know, they, they can weigh the risks or, or the, 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 the desire to, to accept new technologies. I think one great example is Impossible Foods and the Beyond Meat and, and, the, and the new technologies for, for alternatives to meat that taste really great. So Impossible Foods came out with their soy-based burger, was very popular with, with Burger King at, at, in some trials, and then went across the country in, in, with Burger King in a number of high-scale restaurants and a number of high-profile celebrities have endorsed Impossible as a, this great thing for the environment, great thing for, for people, for health. And guess what? It's, it's GMO-based, the, the grain. So at first they were getting attacked about that and they were kind of defensive and wondering if they should go to non-GMO. But their CEO and their team studied it deeply and they came out and said, no, the, the, the GMO technology is helping farmers be more carbon neutral, <laughs> emit less carbon, it's, it's healthy, there's no, there's no health issues with this. We're going to step up and say this technology is good for the world. We're not gonna back off just because there's, there's some, some non-science based discussions about it. We're gonna, we're gonna back the science. And I think that's really important that not only a company like Impossible stands up for the science that's better for the climate and perfectly healthy for, for people, but also the, the endorsers like Ellen DeGeneres and, and, and uh, uh, Venus um, uh, Williams, Serena Williams and others are stepping up and saying, this is great technology, this is really great for the world. I think that's what we need. We need, we need the consumer pull rather than the technology push. Liam, do you want to add to that, Liam? 
Yeah, I, I, I completely, completely agree with, with what Eric said. And I, I think um, what's really important for us, um, say everybody working in agriculture, um, we've got to make sure that we're not working in, in an echo chamber and, and just people talking to each other um, about the wonderful things that we do and complimenting each other. Um, I think we, we've got to do a lot more outreach and particularly also to critical groups um, who do have concerns about how agriculture um, is, concerns, genuine concerns about how agriculture is performed today, um, but also often a lack of understanding. Um, there's often a lot of people in cities who have a strong opinion about agriculture but have never actually been on a farm. Um, and I think we need to encourage a much broader based dialogue. Um, and that requires outreach. I think all the, the, the companies here engage in this. Um, but I think we, we, we need to do this simply at a, at a different level. Um, and this requires industry, but it also requires, I believe, academia, it requires government representation, NGOs, civil society. Um, and I think there's, there's different ways of doing this. Um, we as companies can convene, um, but th there's often a challenge to that because it might be a per perceived bias about what industry actually wants. Sometimes it's helpful to have neutral conveners like universities. Um, but I think the key thing is that we do have an open dialogue with all sections of, of society and focus on uh, forward looking what we actually want to improve and always bring the conversation back to the farmer. Um, how are we going to help a farmer in a specific situation? And here I, I, I fully agree with, with what Josephine said, if, particularly if we're thinking about smallholders, um, especially in Africa, the, the key is not that we're just pushing more, let's say, better, better products. The, the challenges are often much more basic than that. It might be access to, to finance, might be access to markets, um, might be simple lack of knowledge about basic agronomic practices. We have got to make sure that there's a locally relevant uh, ecosystem that is supportive of smallholders. Um, I think this is something that it, where we're making progress, but we've got to be able to scale this. And, and I think the more we can go in this direction, um, the better. But, but I think this broad dialogue in, um, in places like Europe and in the US is really important because what's often forgotten is uh, the political decisions taken particularly in Europe massively affect Africa. So, so regulatory decisions taken in Europe and, and, and the example of gene editing, if Europe says they don't want gene editing, most likely that door is then closed for, for Africa. And, and this is basic, this is political colonialism, and it's based on pressure from society. And that's why we need to engage society to make sure that we can get access um, for also for Africa. Do you want to jump in there, Josephine? Yeah. yeah. And then, and then we'll come point. to Jim. Yes, great point, Liam. That, so Josephine uh, and Jim. Yes, uh, on the decisions that many times really impact on, on Africa. And I think it's a common knowledge that I think when most of the multilateral systems were created, I think around 1947, Africa was nowhere in the room at all. They usually say they were a menu. <laughs> yeah, so then many times they are not part of this decision. So as a, a business, I think how we can influence is these regional blocks. These regional blocks need to have a strong say and they shouldn't just speak as a political bloc but they need to engage with the businesses so that many of the decisions that impact on us, we can relate back. And to me, I think that there is understanding that yes, there's the risk of climate change and the, the recurrent drought. I think we saw what happened in Mozambique earlier and it's, uh, it's common knowledge, but it's not being translated into actual policies that even affect like nutrition because it's related to nutrition, it's related to education, it's related to the financial sector, it cuts across the entire economy. So I think uh, as a private sector, we really need to continue to lobby with both development partners and also the government and at our, 
among our own industry institutions. Okay. Jim. I think the only additive thing, um, I agree with, with everyone that consumer demand pull is, is key, and certainly the engagement that Liam mentioned, and we're doing a lot of that as Corteva. But the one piece I would add is, is the, about youth, the young, young folks is getting them excited about agriculture early, explaining some of the things that we're talking about here uh, early on, and really mobilizing um, this next generation. Because you know we've lost a generation to some of the misinformation um, that's been out there. And so I think it's something that Corteva is also very committed to. It's that youth education, youth involvement, and we're the, the Borlaug uh, Youth Dialogue is also something that um, I think does a really great job of bringing youth in from all around the world and helping them now go out and be missionaries and wanting to be part of agriculture and helping to educate uh, others. They're our next consumers and they're gonna be excited and they're certainly uh, probably uh, gonna be involved in the political arena down the road. It'll be nice to have some, mm -hmm. some friends out there. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> I, I'd like to build just a little on what Jim said because I think it's really critical. Um, we, at least at Kemen, feel that very strongly we have to engage youth in understanding science early that this starts off in first and second grade, that it is science is not something to be intimidated with. And unfortunately, I think we've gotten into a generation where too many people have abdicated their thinking that you have to be a trained scientist to understand some of these issues. And these are critical issues facing us all with nutrition and climate change, and they can be understood by everyone. And so taking this aura away that we're going to have only the scientists be the ones who are educated on these areas is something we feel strongly about and that we have to start in the very early grades that regardless if you become uh, a lawyer, a policeman, a fireman, that you too can have a scientific view on climate change and that you are adequate enough to do that with your education. <laughs> You know, our eating habits are, are constantly changing, but I think that's accelerating. Uh, and, and maybe it's through communication that we, we learn what's better for us. And so the public uh, changes their eating habits in different parts of the world in different order. How can we respond to that? Can we do it quickly enough to get it down to production agriculture? And, and what are you, are you involved in any of that? Yeah, I can, I can make an uh, opening comment on that, is, is that there are, there are enormous changes happening within nutritional, uh, nutrition as well as eating habits. And some of that uh, comes from unfortunate, unfortunate rumors and things that uh, I, I would hate to say fake news that is within social media. Uh, but uh, those types of things can only be dissipated through uh, further education. And our, our efforts in the, along those lines are really to specifically focus on the, the coming back to the science of nutrition because we do so, know so much that we just have to be now push that into the decision makers that are shopping and whether they're shopping in an open market or shopping in a grocery store to be able to make the right nutritional choices. Well, and also, if you look at the data, and, and, and Luis Fresco, who's on our board, the president of Wageningen University, keeps reminding us that we don't, people eat far less vegetables than they need, far less. It's about, we, we eat about 40% of the vegetables or less than we should be eating. So one of the things we're trying to do with our vegetable seed business is keep making vegetables taste better. <laughs> make them taste better, make them, the shelf life last longer so they're less expensive for consumers to buy everywhere. But part of, of nutrition is, is so simple. We know we need to eat more vegetables. So let's make vegetables more available for people all over the world and make them more attractive, the, the, the look and the taste, so people will eat their vegetables. Simple. Oh, it's simple. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to do a follow-on on how are you going but, to do but, that. But it, also, well, no, it also gets back to, back, back to children. You start young children eating their vegetables, and then they expect to eat them for the rest of their life. If they don't eat them as a kid, they'll never start. So educate them as a, as a kid that these, these are good for you and get, 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 make them available. Don't make the candy and the easy stuff available. 
and they'll get on, they'll get the habit. Anybody else want to jump in on this? I Josephine. think, yeah, with vegetables uh, in the context of climate change, for us, uh, I see we have exotic in the company and indigenous vegetables. So you see as the climate, in terms of climate adaptation, the indigenous vegetables are more resilient. Yes. But the challenge is mm -hmm. when you go to all the menus, you find that uh, you need a mindset change so that uh, the ones that are more resilient to the climate are the ones that should be ready to available to, to be consumed. But in terms of eating habits, yes, the population is getting more health conscious, but also there is a drive towards organic products for the export market, which I think is a, a special niche for us because uh, uh, we missed out in terms of uh, high level of uh, intensive farming. It's not yet there in a large portion of, of Africa. So perhaps we can capitalize on that and use that to drive organic production together with conventional and I believe in GM technology. The challenge is just how do we get it segregated so that we know that this is GM, this is conventional and this is organic, but I think there is great opportunity there. As we uh, work toward a close here, we don't have much time left, uh, but uh, why don't each of you tell us what work you're either doing or have done that you're most proud of? I, I think it, it starts with some of the things we, we talked about around taking the, these amazing tools that we have with, from bio, a biotechnology perspective, conventional breeding, and thinking of ways to, to elevate the role that agriculture can play in, in, in solving the two big challenges that we've been talking about. F feeding, and we know we can do more with less inputs, but also how could agriculture play this amazing role as being part of a solution around things like climate change. It, it can actually be part of the answer, not, not no longer part of the, the problem. So the, the way our team has incorporated that thinking into the way we're designing and developing new products, uh, to Liam's point, the way we're engaging now with, with broader, uh, a broader set of folks, and every employee, 20,000 folks around the world, knowing that they're a missionary for, for that, and actively a part of their daily routine, they're finding some way to engage in the discussion, to have a better dialogue, to maybe move some perceptions. Uh, and that, that has occurred very, very quickly. So I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of, as, as the Corteva team has come together, globally that we've, we've really adopted helping farmers and also being connected to consumers and starting to be part of that dialogue of positive benefit and not so defensive on the, all the negative things. Yeah, I guess um, overall, I mean, both, both as Bayer and, and, and as an industry agriculture, I think we can all be tremendously proud that we are actually feeding the world. Um, I think that this is, if you look at where we're coming from, and I come from a, a country that was devastated by hunger in, in Ireland in the 1850s. A million people out of a population of 8 million died because of hunger, because a potato crop failed for something as basic as, as, as basically a, a disease, a bl potato blight. Um, another million people left the country at that time because they were, they were starving and they didn't see a future. Um, most of them, by the way, ended up in the US. That's why the genes in the US are so good. <laughs> but, but, but I think, um, I think the, the, the pivot now is for us as an industry and what we can, can and, 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 and need to be more proud about but also make the pivot is um, similar to what Jim said. It's not just about feeding the world. It's about feeding the world without starving the planet and making agriculture um, part of the solution of climate change as opposed to being seen as a key part of the problem. And I, to, I think if you can combine, if we can combine all together those two, feed the world and do it in a sustainable manner, there is no more exciting industry in the entire world. So I think we can all be proud about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, what I'm most proud of, I come from northern Uganda. We had a 20-year civil war. And um, my observation during war, the women hold the households. And it was the motivation that got me start Victoria Seeds. Because uh, I realized that to get their dignity back, 
they really needed to go back and have some control over what they do. And uh, I remember, well, the very, very first farmer groups I engaged with were from an internally displaced people's camp. And when I went to them, I said, you know, I've come to you today. I am not FAO, I'm not CRS, I'm not World Food that is giving you free handouts, but all these people will not be there, but I'll be there. I have nothing to offer you today except the knowledge and engage you as seed contract growers. And I know there was some book that was written later and it's entitled The Look on Their Faces. So the look on their faces the, after they realize that uh, when they engage with a seed enterprise, it is just not just knowledge, but they also guarantee themselves a market. So that is something that always stays and makes me truly proud. But most important right now, it's good to know that the farmers we engage with now know the difference between just hybrid maize and drought tolerant hybrid maize. So it took a lot of hard work for them to choose that and giving that basic uh, opportunity for the farmer to be able to know that they better pick up the drought tolerant hybrid maize to address the challenge of climate change is a major success for me. Hmm. Very good. Eric. The, the thing I'm most proud of is, is, is how we help smallholder farmers around the world, as Syngenta and as an industry. A uh, week before last, I was in a, a small area, a small village area of, of eastern India called Elru, and we have a Syngenta learning center there, and we only teach women uh, poor area, from poor areas how, how to develop agriculture careers. And I was, somebody asked, why, why only women? Well, if we had a mixed classroom, the men would speak and the women would be pushed to the side and, or, or they wouldn't be there. So we only teach women. And to see the faces of these women that otherwise would have no professional career, they would be at home doing very little, maybe getting water, but knowing that they're gonna have a great career in, in, in agriculture just makes them so happy and so thrilled. But I would also add, so I'm very proud of that, but I would also say that we're doing a lot as an industry to feed the planet and, and deal with climate change. But I don't think we should be proud until we stop the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere and see that start decreasing. And one of the first goals that we have to have is stop deforestation. We cannot solve climate change as the forests burn. We have to stop that as an industry. You know, when, as I look back, uh, probably the thing that I am most proud of is really the change that I've seen within uh, our industry. Uh, when I enter, entered agriculture uh, almost 40 years ago, uh, quite frankly, in, in all of the technology fields, uh, it was male-dominated, uh, completely male-dominated. And there was no, nothing close to gender equality. And I look especially, and, and gender equality still has a long ways to go, but as I look across the scientists especially uh, that have now come on and are now leading uh, so much of the technological efforts at our company as well as in so out throughout agriculture, to have this closer, I won't say equal, but closer to some sort of gender equality and to finally been tapping into literally half the population who was never asked about their ideas on science and how to solve these various problems. That gives me great hope that we will actually be able to feed nine billion people in 2045. Thanks. <laughs> Well, we have, uh, we have gone over, but I just uh, personally, and I think I'm speaking for the audience, have uh, been so fascinated with the knowledge you all have and what is happening, uh, both the pessimistic side, but particularly the optimistic side. And, and finishing up with this optimistic side, I'm just sorry there's not more time, but we thank you for coming and uh, talking with us this morning. We've all learned a lot. Thank you. Whoops. <laughs>